what I did was focus on stories that seemed to me to be apocryphal. So I'm looking at stories for which there is no actual <laughs> evidence and saying that these are mythological. Now, whether that's a correct usage of the term myth in the eyes of some classical academics, I'm not certain. But I believe these apocryphal stories are invested with meaning. Thank you for joining us on the podcast of the History Teachers Association of New South Wales. My name's Jonathan Dallymore, and today I'm joined by Mark Dappen, who is a Sydney-based journalist and historian who currently has a number of publications to his name, These include the Penguin Book of Australian War Writing, a novel about the Thai Burma Railway called Spirit House, and three books on Australian military history, Jewish Anzacs, the Nashos War, and his most recent, which is Australia's Vietnam, Myth vs. History. This interview is a brief look into that latest book where we discuss issues about how historical myths can emerge, the role of oral history in history making, and also how historical myths can be challenged by the work of historians. Australia's Vietnam is a fantastic book that challenges many popular stories about our history of this period, and I hope you enjoy this interview with Mark Dappen. Hi Mark, welcome to the podcast. Hi Jonathan, thanks for asking me. You've had quite an interesting career working in a number of different fields, from uh, public journalism to now sort of more academic scholarly stuff, and you've also written a novel. Could you talk to us about the journey behind arriving at this book, Australia's Vietnam, Myth versus History? I actually started as a historian um, of sorts. I graduated from university in England and became uh, something called a community history worker, which was uh, attached to um, the Herbert Art Gallery and Museum in Coventry. We had a small team who were supposed to cater for the kind of oral historical needs of the local community. And it turned out the community had none whatever. Um, We never, that I can recall during my year there, had a single member of the community uh, ask us to assist them with with, um, oral history. Um, We spent most of our time making leaflets that um, we hoped would show the representative faces of the community, the black, brown, yellow people that lived in Coventry, in the hope perhaps that they would recognise themselves on a flyer and come and ask us to help them with their history. But as I said, they were too busy um, getting on with their lives. So although that was pretty much a dream job for a recent graduate who was interested in history, when it ended, I sort of drifted away from that area. Um, Then I became... uh, Obviously, it's a long story, (laughs) but I came out here and became a typesetter and a journalist um, in that order. Uh, But I never lost an interest in history as a reader, and I wrote about history whenever I could once I became a features writer. Um, I did a second, my first undergraduate degree was in social studies. Um, Then I did an MA in journalism. And then I took another degree um, majoring in history of art and started to study history formally again for, you know, the first time since school. But I never lost that love of it. So there's a a robust background to your historical work but at some point as well you've begun to work much more on military history projects can you tell us a a bit about how that came about i was working on my novel spirit house when the publisher of penguin asked me if i'd be interested in editing the penguin book of australian war writing he asked me a because he used to be my work experience boy at the financial review and b because he knew that I've been doing, he knew that I've been reading a lot of Australian war writing um, in my research for Spirit House, which is about Australian POWs on the Burma Railway. So I said I would, and that led me to read um, the whole spectrum of first-person Australian memoir and journalism, um, dating back from invasion, colonisation, whatever you like to call it, up to Afghanistan. So I sort of had a you know, a year's primer in military history. 
Um, and then after that, they are, even though they, nobody bought that book, it, it got a sequel. Um, the Penguin Book of First World War writing, which was called From the Trenches. And From the Trenches, people did buy. Um, and that was a mixture of memoir and fiction of the First World War. So all the time, this was kind of feeding a, an interest in history that I guess had, had lain partially hungry, not starved, but not entirely sated um, in the decades that I'd been writing journalism. Um, and the fiction fed into it, the journalism fed into it, publishing world fed into it. And I noticed when I was um, editing the Penguin Book of Australian War Writing that there wasn't a lot that was of any literary value about the Vietnam War in particular. And especially there wasn't a lot written by national servicemen. So I thought I would write a biography of the national service scheme, essentially. I That became my book, The Nashos War, in an attempt to sort of get free editing services for The Nashos War. I enrolled in a PhD at ADFA, um, which was... <laughs> Yeah, like all my attempts to do anything underhand just failed miserably um, and it resulted not in me having my brilliant supervisor Jeffrey Gray edit my book for me for nothing but me having to write a second book about the Vietnam War directly after the first and that second the first book was the Nashos War the second was Australia's Vietnam myth versus history which I believe is what we're here to talk about today uh, yes we certainly are and I would like to start talking about this book by exploring some of the ideas that you discuss in an early chapter called The Myths I Helped to Create. I actually came into this book thinking that this was going to be a work where you trained your sights on other scholars and, and journalists and other things and try to pick apart their arguments and bring forward some historical evidence to challenge these perceptions. Now, obviously, that's a big part of this, but you also are actually quite self-reflective in this book and challenge some things that you've also written could you start by talking about this aspect of the book? Well, I think journalism is at the heart of the story, the way journalism works and the way journalists present their findings. So I tried to uh, view that through the prism of my own practice, I suppose. Um, so the first time I wrote about Vietnam veterans, I wrote a piece about the Vietnam Veterans Motorcycle Club, um, which, you know, looking back, they were clearly an unrepresentative swathe of the veteran community. You know, veterans who dress up as bikers, veterans who are, to all intents and purposes, bikers in their late 50s and early 60s, which is a little old, actually, for, for an outlaw biker. And I presented the war in the way that they had framed it to me, the war and particularly the homecoming. At a time, I was very interested in subcultures, and I guess I saw the Vietnam Veterans Motorcycle Club as a, a deviant subculture, um, like skinheads or punks, but much older um, and with a much more colourful past. I think I probably went there looking for war stories, maybe even massacre stories. I don't know that at the time... I had really absorbed the Australian ideas about Vietnam veterans until I met these men. And these men, you know, they were a very good company. Um, they were very open. Um, they were good drinkers, which I always like in a bloke. And they were quite bitter. And the stories they told me about being spat on, having blood thrown on them, um, suffering from uh, PTSD and other mental illnesses, being ostracised by society, are the stories that I reproduced as if they were the individual, not only the individual experiences of the people there, but as if they were representative of a wider Vietnam veterans experience. When as in actual fact, I'd come there looking for a small deviant and I'm not using the word deviant in any pejorative sense, looking to do a sociological piece about a small, um, almost self-contained community that was not 
either like the community about uh, around it or the wider veterans community. Um, I came back with virtually no war stories and a lot of stories about PTSD, spitting protesters, or I may have killed, I may have been involved in atrocities, dark illusions. Um, and it's all brilliant copy. You know, it, it's great, you know, to see elderly men um, purging their demons. Uh, you know, it's the alternative, going to a meeting of well-adjusted veterans discussing whether to relay the turf on the lawn of the bowling club, if indeed people do relay turf on bowling club lawns, uh, there's, there's no story there. Mm -hmm. So when I, so I do begin the book talking about my own preconceptions and specifically things that I wrote at the time that I either no longer believe or no longer believe to be representative. And I try to trace a personal journey. Although I was resistant to the idea of making a book about me because pretty much everything that I write ends up being about me in some way, um, a little more explicitly than perhaps other writers always write about themselves. But I was encouraged to, I quote, put more of yourself in it. And that did make me reflect upon my the journey through the book and my motivations for writing it at the beginning and how I felt about it at the end. So there's a final chapter which also draws into my uh, autobiography, I suppose. It's also probably important by way of introduction to discuss the concept of myth simply because you know, it's a concept that's in the title and it's a concept that runs throughout the book, but it, but it is an idea that people define in different ways. Could you just set up how you were using the term myth in this book? Well, I had trouble finding a working definition of myth, not one that I could squeeze to fit my, to fit my thesis, but one that was broadly agreed upon by academics. So what I did was focus on stories that seemed to me to be apocryphal. So I'm looking at stories for which there is no actual <laughs> evidence and saying that these are mythological. Now, whether that's a correct usage of the term myth in the eyes of some classical academics, I'm not certain. But I believe these apocryphal stories are invested with meaning. So I try to understand what their meaning might be, explain what their meaning was at the time, perhaps, and sometimes that's come to mean something else later, um, while simultaneously or subsequently or previously presenting evidence that this, these things cannot have happened. They must have been myth. Since they, since they didn't present a true record of events at the time, what does that make them and why did people make them and what have we done with them and what effect has what we did with these had on our idea of historiography as relates to Vietnam? I'd never actually codified it to quite that extent, but I think that's what I was doing. If we start concentrating on some of the specific ideas in the book then, it's probably most logical to start with the National Service Scheme and conscription because you've written a whole book on this uh, previously, but also it comes back up again in this book. Could you discuss some of the main misconceptions that you think still persist around Australia's National Service Scheme in this period? I think... Among national servicemen themselves, there's enormous debate as to whether or not they volunteered to go to Vietnam. There, this is one of the few moments where I think the impetus to myth is entirely political. I do think that the, the idea that men who were conscripted into the army were then given the choice to fight overseas, even when it's quite clear that they did that they were not, even though the government said in no uncertain terms time and time again 
that once they were in the army, men could not refuse to go to Vietnam if they were caught to go to Vietnam. The idea that all of these men were volunteers does in a way legitimate the Australian military effort. It says that nobody went there and was killed against their will. Um, you know, we didn't <laughs> essentially press gang and, and lead people to their deaths. Uh, you know, to an extent, you can see where it comes from. Um, you know, a lot of people went willingly into national service, which is a fact that is forgotten. And a majority of national servicemen, I'm certain, went willingly to Vietnam. That does not mean they all did or they were all offered a chance to opt out. As I said, in fact, the Fraser government repeatedly said, if you're called up to go, you go. And it wasn't until, I think, 1971 when uh, Peacock announced that uh, national service women were no longer obliged to go to Vietnam. Now, if they'd been, if you're going to make an announcement to say that they're no longer obliged um, five years after their first deployment in Vietnam, then they must have been obliged previously. But in a book, I, you know, reproduce various documents that prove conclusively <laughs> that uh, some people went to Vietnam against, they were sent to Vietnam against their will, did everything they could not to go, disobeyed orders, and yet still ended up in Vietnam. That doesn't mean they all did, and I suspect it doesn't even mean that a statistically significant number did. But nonetheless, they, those people existed, their stories should be told. And although there was little dissent in the Australian army during the war, there was some. Okay, let's move on to a second theme, Anne, and that is to explore the character, quality, uh, behaviour, whatever you want to call it, of the Australian army while it's deployed in Vietnam. There are stories of Australian soldiers and units committing atrocities in Vietnam, but there are also very well-documented cases of, say, the American Army or its ally South Korea uh, committing atrocities whilst deployed in Vietnam as well. So you could be forgiven for kind of assuming that this is what militaries did in the context of this very brutal war and that Australia was no different. Could you comment on the... Australian army, its behaviour and the, the notion of the Australian atrocity in Vietnam? Well, the, the fact is that there was no Australian me lie. I mean, there was a time, I think, when the peace movement would almost have welcomed one um, as something to use in propaganda. And I think there's a certain <laughs> psychotic veterans who perhaps, you know, allude to the possibility that they have been involved in such things. There are also people that pretend to be Vietnam veterans, that curious segment of the population, um, who, who would also darkly allude to the possibility of massacres. But the fact is there, is, there is no documentary evidence of any kind of massacre of deliberate massacre of civilians by Australian troops at any time during the Vietnam War. A lot of Australian troops had very, very little contact with Vietnamese civilians. A lot of Australian troops had no contacts at all with the Viet Cong. Um, a lot of Australian troops didn't hear a shot fired in anger. Um, and that's not just base troops that includes you know a, a large number of infantrymen um there was not a great deal of contact in in either sense um in the vietnam war unless you were in certain units at certain times and we know exactly where we had a small army in a small area we know pretty much exactly where everybody was at any given time and they were not in the area of massacres that are alluded to in early oral histories of Australia's Vietnam War. It, the stories that are told about Australian troops, you know, um, machine gunning civilians and then raping corpses, there's no, there's no possibility that they can be true. And because I think to an extent the left has withdrawn from writing histories of the Vietnam War, uh, 
these ideas haven't even really been propagated since the since the very first oral history and the right's not interested in exploring these questions anyway so the it's so what people have is an overall impression that australian troops may have been brutal and indiscriminate and massacred civilians because that's what they've seen on television or in movies about American troops. There seems to be a popular view as well that the Australian soldiers who return from Vietnam are treated quite differently to, say, other Australian vets from from different wars. And again, you're, you're challenging perceptions of the way veterans would treated in general without i think denying that there were cases here and there where where certainly um unfortunate things took place but generally speaking you you sort of you sort of make this argument that they were treated in some respects as kind of in a similar way can you talk about that as veterans of other wars yeah yeah well i think they were um what happened again what indisputably happened what is documented as having occurred is in 1966 when 1st Battalion, a battalion with no certainly no national servicemen when it first left for Vietnam, um, may have been a few in it when it came back, uh, marched through Sydney to be met by a couple of people, maybe half a dozen people waving placards in the crowd, and a woman called Nadine Jensen who was connected with no organisation who doused herself in an admix of red paint and kerosene and ran at the leader's of the um, march, smearing the first guy with red paint and then running into the second guy and also knocking some red paint off to him. I think that idea, the idea of Nadine Jensen and you know her blood libel against the troops has been adopted by a whole swathe of Vietnam veterans who, who may say, you know, we had blood thrown on us, we had red paint thrown on us, there are no other documented incidents at all of this, of troops being hit with red paint. There's cars being hit with red paint or different coloured paint. Um, there's eggs being thrown at people who are not soldiers because there's also this whole motif of food being thrown at people. Um, but it's only Nadine Jensen. And I say, when veterans say we were, I think they're talking of themselves as a whole. I don't think often they're saying I was or me and my friends were. They're saying people who represented me, the 1st Battalion, people who were me in, a, in an earlier incarnation had blood, had blood that is red paint smeared on them. Smeared being an appropriate word, you know, we were smeared as killers, blood as in blood libel, you know, everybody thought we were. But in fact, the welcome home parades were far, far larger than the largest demonstrations, you know. Hundreds of thousands of people came to welcome one Ra through the streets of Sydney, 1st Battalion, that is, and only seven of them were protesters. So why we should remember the seven over the other tens of thousands um, is a question that I can't, I actually can't answer. It's one that looms over the book and I barely have a theory about it. The idea that Vietnam veterans were spat on when they came home, which is regurgitated unquestioningly, by journalists time and time again, seems to have its root in the movie First Blood, the first Rambo movie, which came out in 1981. Until Rambo, Sylvester Stallone, said in 1981 that he was spat on by spat upon by demonstrators when he came home, there was not one single instance of an Australian soldier reporting having been spat on during the course of the war. Similarly, the first demonstration against men coming home held at an airport was not reported in Australia until 1982, um, three years after the first demonstration had actually been shown on the big screen, a demonstration about against soldiers returning in the movie Coming Home with Jane Fonda. Both these myths actually have their root in American cinema, not even in American experience, but in American cinema which has provided a lot of people, even in Australia, with their view of the Vietnam War. And, you know, they're good films, so <laughs> you can kind of see why. What about the other sort of stories that I grew up hearing a lot about in terms of, and you see them in books as well, in terms of things like, you know, Vietnam vets not being treated in the same way by, by say, the RSL club and, 
you know, the, the typical story I had was, you know, the welcome home big ceremony in the 1980s was the sort of first time that they were really welcomed. There aren't there other, other stories we could feed in here to say that, you know, that they were treated differently in other circumstances, though? Well, the myth of the RSL is co- I covered in an essay in another book. The idea that the RSL are in some way unsupportive of Vietnam the Vietnam veterans during the war itself is absolutely absurd. It's it's ludicrous. The RSL was fanatical that national service should be brought back after the last scheme ended in 1959, and it was 100% behind the Vietnam War, and it was 100% behind the veterans. There were large send-off parties for many individual soldiers from their local RSLs and there were large welcomes for many soldiers from their local RSLs when they came back. The split between the veterans movement and the RSLs did not occur in the war during the war itself. It occurred when the veterans began through the Vietnam Veterans Association of Australia began a campaign um, to get compensation for Agent Orange which is a, a whole side story. That's when you start to find these stories coming up. You know, I was refused entrance to my RSL. And again, I think, although I don't talk about it in a book, I think it's apocryphal in the same way as the other stories. You know, it felt like they were being shut out of the RSL because their cause was, they felt though their cause was being denigrated by the RSL, being denigrated by other veterans. Which is certainly not to say that on an unofficial level, there weren't blokes in the clubs who said, you know, you weren't... Again, the thing you hear over and over again, they told me I wasn't in a proper war. But if you look back, you'll see that Second World War veterans were told by First World War veterans they weren't in a proper war. You know, if you weren't in a trench, mate, you don't know what killing really was really about. And if you look at things now, in Sydney, in certain RSL clubs, which are now run by Vietnam veterans, there is a marked reluctance to include veterans of the Afghanistan conflict. Why is that? It's not because there's any kind of um, political problem among Vietnam veterans with Afghan with Afghan veterans. It's not because I mean they may or may not think it's a just war, but I suspect they do. The majority of them. Um, it's because it's their little club. It's their it's their little social group, and they don't want these new guys in it any more than the Second World War veterans wanted the Vietnam veterans any more than the First World War veterans wanted the Second World War veterans. At different points throughout the book, you also make the the point about a very vocal conservative Australia being an important part of the history here, but that has largely kind of maybe been forgotten or downplayed, however you want to put that. Have we generally made too much of the anti-war movements and that view of the war, do you think, in our history? I think often when we're writing history, we look at what's new rather than what's continuous. And there was something novel about the anti-war movement. It was novel that people should protest in what became such numbers so vehemently and for such a long time. Australia had not seen that kind of organised, prolonged street protest um, against anything else, Um, which doesn't mean there haven't been big strikes, it doesn't mean there weren't big labour movement demonstrations, but there was nothing that was quite like the anti-war movement until the anti-war movement. However, that seems to have led to an idea that everybody was against the war. The anti-war movement was tiny when it began and remained fairly small until until it disappeared. The majority of Australians remained the same conservative people that indeed elected conservative governments throughout the period of the Vietnam War. Now, why the not particularly silent majority have been forgotten, I I don't know. But you could argue, and I would argue, that their welcome home parades for the troops, of which there were 16 during the war itself, the largest of which were larger, than any moratorium demonstrations, I would argue that they were the moratoriums of conservative Australia. They were the huge showings of support for a war for the troops for national service. And I suppose part of the reason, now I'm getting getting carried away with my own train of thought here, but having said I don't know the reason, I suppose part of the reason is that after the um, 1987 
reunion and welcome home parade of all Vietnam veterans, people began to say, I've never had a welcome, I never had a welcome home parade before. And of course, a lot of Vietnam veterans didn't, but a lot of Vietnam veterans did. And if you start saying there were no welcome home parades, then you forget conservative Australia, you forget the their moratoriums, their, the, sh the show of strength that they put on at every welcome home parade. In my reading of the American historiography of the Vietnam War, as limited as it is, I think there is a tendency to associate myths with political explanations. And so what I mean by that is you'll, you'll often hear people talking about how the right or the left is using examples or ideas from the Vietnam War to push a particular kind of political barrow in the in the current climate. Um, so, you know, Greg Dadis has famously kind of written about this in relation to views about General Abrams, you know, and this idea that, oh, they could have won, you know, the view about General Abrams is everything's improving, they could have won with a bit more time, and that means that the American military can do what it wants if it's given freedom to do it. That underpins Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. You don't really use those kind of arguments in this book to explain the myths that you're talking about. Can you maybe just try to encapsulate your explanation of, of why these myths are in Australia and where they came from? I think it's lazy journalism. I think it's people hearing something that makes good copy in a newspaper, reproducing that in a newspaper, that story going into a clip file, um, another journalist looking at the clip file uh, when he's been dispatched on a similar story, um, being told to find a damaged veteran himself, be great if he was spat on, uh, comes back asking a bunch of people, are you damaged, were you spat on? And producing yet another story about a spat on guy. Now, I don't actually think that there's any particular political motivation behind that, uh, beyond the motivation to sell newspapers. I don't know if there's much motivation at all. That isn't to say that I don't think these stories can be used or even that I don't think these stories haven't been used, but I don't think their main purpose was, <laughs> was functional. <laughs> um, I think they grew up because people believed they had happened um, and because without these stories, the Vietnam War... And certainly the aftermath of Vietnam War is much less interesting. It's more boring. You know, they, you could you say you had 100 Vietnam veterans in a room and you said to one of them, uh, so describe your homecoming experience. And uh, the guy said, oh, I got on a plane. Mum and dad were there waiting for me at the airport, came home, think I had a couple of beers and I went to bed. OK, you can have 80 people tell you that. And if number 81 says six guys were outside the airport waving posters, call me a baby killer, they spat in my face... Which one as a journalist are you going to quote? I know which one I would have quoted. And in fact, I did. Um, not immediately after the war, but when I wrote about veterans for the first time. You know, one's a story and the other 80 aren't stories. But is that one true or is it merely apocryphal? I think they were uh, apocryphal. Which is not to say that they've never been used because they, ha they have been used politically. The, the main ex major example is by John Howard in the run-up to the Iraq War when he asked people not to protest against the soldiers, you know, if they were going to blame anybody, blame him. What he meant by that was not blame him. It wasn't John Howard calling for massive demonstrations against John Howard. He was essentially calling for no demonstrations at all. I wonder if you could just talk briefly about what you hope this book might actually achieve. Well, I hope it will win me a prize, obviously. But I also hope that it will improve um, the standard of Australian journalism about Vietnam War and Vietnam veterans. I hope that the writers who, young, young writers who come to feature pieces with the idea is in their head that Australian Vietnam veterans are mad people who committed massacres and got spat on when they came home, might look in, might Google, <laughs> were our Australian Vietnam veterans spat out on psychopaths who commit massacres, and both at home and, <laughs> and during the war. Um, and see my book and see that there's another side to it. I, I hope that it'll stop people from hunting for the most severely disturbed veterans and then presenting their account as if it were representative of the veteran community. Um, I hope it'll lead journalists to reflect upon the need to check what their sources tell them. Um, I hope that 
it will have some effect on oral historians, many of whom are still unrepentant that the oral histories they gather are emotional histories rather than factual histories, that they do not, in fact, reflect events. I don't think oral history is worthless by any means. I do... I'm interested in the idea of histories being told from below. Um, the Nashos War was essentially an oral history based on interviews with 160 um, national uh, national servicemen, and in which were handful were protesters, but the majority went to the Vietnam War. But at those times when their testimony contradicted the documentary record, then I did not use their testimony. This has not been the way with many, many popular history books about Vietnam. And I guess, you know, I'm not going to make a life's work out of it or anything, but I guess if any good comes of my book, I would like to see that happen more. That's a great place to leave the interview, Mark. So thank you for coming in and talking to us, and I wish you all the best for the book. Thanks for asking me. Appreciate it.